Hi, guys. Uh, we're here to talk about the book, Dernet, et cetera. Um, my name is Arielle Bruce. I am the director of development here at Kelly Writer's House. I'm also a giant fan of Tumblr. I just had my seven year anniversary Congrats. on Tumblr. Um, so I am mostly a person who tried to put together this program because it was the kind of program I wanted to see, and it happened. So it's a good week for me. Um, I'm here with Rachel Fershlaser and Maris Kreisman, both of whom are Penn alumna. Uh, Rachel is class of 2002 and Maris 2000. Um, We're very old. Yes. We're old. Yes, we remember a time before the internet. Uh, it's Oof. not quite true, but it's before the internet was everywhere and was the way that you needed to talk. So uh, for those of you who don't know Rachel and Morris, Rachel Fershlaser here on my left works on Tumblr's outreach team specializing in publishing, nonprofit, and cultural organizations. She was previously the community manager at Bookish and director of public programs at Housing Works Bookstore Cafe. But you might also know her as the co-creator and co-editor of the six-word memoir series, including Not Quite What I Was Planning, or possibly uh, the creator of the Reblog Book Club on Tumblr, which I hope to talk about at length. Yeah. 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 Oh, we got dancing yes. already. That's great. We're, we're good. <laughs> and then Maris Kreisman, um, while we're talking about amazing Tumblr things, um, is the creator of Slaughterhouse 90210, which if you don't know about, I honestly kind of want to build in five minutes for you to look it up and have mm. you flip through right now. Um, it's an incredible blog and soon to be book uh, coming out later this year uh, that celebrates the intersection of literature and television. Um, she's currently a publishing specialist at Kickstarter, so she helps get off the ground every kind of book publishing or book tour kind of project on Kickstarter. Um, and as a former book editor, Maris cannot get enough of critiquing her own writing. So um, I brought these two women together to talk about this notion of the booknet. Um, the booknet is this idea that it's the, just a silly word. It's not like Rachel a real made it word. up. <laughs> it's just like the bookish internet. I don't really see how that makes it not a real word. But well, people have gotten really intense. Like, sorry to interrupt your introduction, <laughs> but um, like I did a panel for Publishers Weekly yesterday for publishers that was literally like, "What is the booknet? And what do you have to know about it? And how is this impacting your business?" And I was like, "Guys, <laughs> literally, like it just means the bookish internet." Yes, but so. say it, please. It's all your. It's, it's all ours. So the Booknet, I kind of, because it's all ours is why, what makes it interesting. It is the notion that we use the internet so that now, instead of when all of you were too young to remember, when it would just be <laughs> that like a book would come out and if you were really tapped in, you knew when the book was coming out. Now it is this online community where you can be tapped in and you can actually be talking to your favorite authors and you can know when your bookstore is gonna have a program and you're, you can tell your bookstore that you wish you had this program mm -hmm. and you can listen to publishers and talk about the kinds of books that you would wanna see and that kind of thing. It's this- And the author might know who you are too. Exactly. Um, like for instance, when Lori Hulse Anderson reblogged my post about this event and yes. I was like, I read your book when I was 14. <laughs> like I, this is crazy. So it is, Really wonderful to have them both here. Um, we are going to talk about the book Jeanette, but I also just kind of wanted to um, have them here so that we could talk about the ways in which they got their careers. Because the careers that these two women have were not careers that really existed when I was in college and not when they were in college. And it was at, not, not at until this, we did them. Right. So it was, you know, at the time you thought online. you needed to break into publishing by being an editorial assistant, making a lot of photocopies and getting a lot of coffee and you would work your way up and maybe you would cry one book and maybe it would fail and you would go back. Now it is this, this way to get a job by actually just participating and being there in the first place and creating your own career by making tools. So I, if we can start with Maris, um, we're just, I'm just going to ask you to tell me how your career has been since Penn. Okay. So... Um, when I was leaving Penn, I was one of the few people who didn't have a job lined up <laughs> of people I knew, and that made me very stressed out. But I'm very happy to say that um, I was able to get a job in book publishing pretty quickly. Nice. And I was working as an editorial assistant. Wait, can I, if we're going to nitty gritty, did you know someone? Did you have get an introduction? How'd you get that very first publishing okay, job? Okay, so I skipped over that. Oh, sorry. I took a six-week course called... Oh, I knew that called the Radcliffe Publishing Course. And the reason I skipped over it is because I think it was really helpful for me in 2000, and I'm not sure it's so useful now. Um, when, when we graduated from that course, there were 100 people, 
and 99 of us got jobs immediately afterwards based on that course. Mm -hmm. I don't think that exists anymore, and I think that's a great thing because you shouldn't have to pay an extra $7,000 for a six-week course when you've already studied your ass off. Um, so yeah, after that, I got a job at a literary agency, and then that's what landed me um, at Simon & Schuster doing editorial work, and I loved it. I loved every miserable thing about it, and one of the things that I wasn't prepared for when I graduated from Penn was just how to be a good office worker. We, um, and, and that's just like how to answer the phone properly, how to deal with bosses who are very particular about certain kinds of situations, how to deal with authors who are freaking out about their books. Um, and so I did the whole thing and I learned a lot, but about five years into my career, um, I left to take another job and was very quickly laid off there. And I found myself, um, not sure who I was if I wasn't in the book publishing world and what was I going to do. And the book turnet is, turns out, what saved me. Um, I was at a dead end job eventually and I started a Tumblr because I was bored. <laughs> and through my Tumblr, I was able to meet very interesting people and become part of a conversation that Rachel has managed to turn into such a good, space at Tumblr in particular. That was before I worked there though. I take I take no credit. Um but I think when you when you started there things picked up for me too. Yeah, that's right. Um and I was able to participate in the publishing world in a way that I never imagined that I could. Um when you're an assistant you're taught to I don't know if it's true anymore. When I was an assistant we were taught to answer the phone well and speak Speak when spoken to, like we were some like Victorian children in like a novel about sad or unarrested development. Yes, that too. And the book turnet was the place where I could express my own opinion. Um, so, so now I work at Kickstarter, and I'm a publishing specialist there. And I am just really excited every day about the different ways that people are using the platform to make great new things. And I can talk about that a little more later. Great. Then we're just going to do the kind of narrative of Rachel's career. And then we'll get into kind of more of these bigger thoughts. Yeah. So my deep, dark secret is that I was not an English major. I don't know. Everyone assumes I was. Me either. Um, I was a psych major and a theater arts minor, which was sort of Englishy. I like read plays and wrote about them and stuff. Um, but, and I was in pen dance. That was like mostly all I did was like modern dance with a bunch of weird girls, which was really great. Um, and so when it turned out that I did not want to like go to psychology grad school and study pigeons or whatever, um, people were like, you guys have seen the pigeons, right? They're really gross. No? Have you? The okay, pigeons. Sorry. I know that there are six different kinds of pigeons. I'm not there sure. are like pigeons that they study in the psych department and they're way grosser than the rats. Sorry. <laughs> I've like, never seen animals. animals. Wow. Um, okay. I was a psych major. <laughs> okay, sorry. So then they tell you, if you don't want to do psych, I don't know who they is, but I swear. They're like, well, you can do marketing. If you know how people think, you can do marketing. Um, so then I started doing like marketing and PR for Broadway shows because I figured like I care if people go see theater. Um, and that was kind of a neat idea, but didn't really work out for me. And then when I was unemployed, uh, all I wanted to do was read books. And then I was like, oh, maybe I want to work in publishing. And it, I hadn't been one of these lifelong wanting to work in publishing people. I think it was more like, I always loved to read books, but I like just figured everyone else loves to read books. Like you're not like, oh, I like TV, so clearly I like have to work in television. Um, and so, when I went to interview for publishing jobs at you know 22 after one internship, they were like, oh, you're not an editor, you're in PR. <laughs> and I was like, I guess. Um, and so they offered me a PR job um, at HarperCollins, and that was through HotJobs.com. Um, wow. Yeah. Well, that's why I bring it up is like I, I didn't know anybody. I mean, I was very, very lucky that I could live with my parents while I worked internships. Like, there's all kinds of privilege all over, but like, I did just go on HotJobs.com and get this interview. Um, and I did book PR at HarperCollins, and I did it at Simon and Schuster. And this again is like. I call it before the internet. Like, obviously, it's not actually before the internet was invented, as one of my favorite YouTube commenters likes to tell me. Um, but it was before anybody really used internet in, like, book conversations. And so as a book publicist, you sent books to, like, the New York Times and the Cleveland Plain Dealer and the Charlotte, I don't remember anymore, but to the 
to newspapers and to Barnes and Noble and to morning show producers. Um, and he made a lot of phone calls. Yes, and we did email, <laughs> but 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 it was only to this like very specific like gatekeeper class kind of like, and we never talked to readers like ever, and we never heard back from readers ever, and like. I think there's maybe some nostalgia for a time before every single person on Twitter could tell you what they think of your book, <laughs> but it's also a really amazing opportunity. And so, um, I was not that happy in publicity just cause making people really excited about reading is great. But when they hand you your list and it's like, here are 14 diet books and a Rush Limbaugh memoir, <laughs> suddenly like making people excited about books doesn't seem like the same thing anymore. Um, and I think the publicists who have the best jobs is like if you're at an imprint where most of your writers are great, I, I still think it can be a super satisfying job. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have a boss who lets you do creative things, um, and I just kept running up against like we don't do that, we don't do that, we don't do that, um, which is like a funny answer because like if we did, then we would, and then your argument would be invalid. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so I quit um, in 2005, like not really knowing what I was going to do, and I like nannied for a while, which was great. Um, and like freelance wrote, and then I was a research assistant on Freakonomics. This is probably like too slow of a version. And I started volunteering once a week at Housing Works Bookstore Cafe, which is a nonprofit aid service organization with a bookstore. And I loved being there, and it was the total opposite, right? You're talking to readers all day long. You don't know who they are, what their background is, like whatever. They're asking you questions, and there's like, I was the story lady, and there's screaming kids, and there's homeless people, and it's just like this big public space, and it's like a very different feeling than the cubicle. Um, and I loved it. I never wanted to leave. And so I was like a part-time bookseller there and then a full-time bookseller. And then I eventually became the director of public programs, which basically means I ran events like this, book launches, book parties, um, but a lot of weird things too. We did like a Bjork concert. We did like an Ann Carson poetry dance installation. Um, it was just like- standard post-college stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. It was just like, a, I mean, the space holds 300 people. And because it's an AIDS charity, people are willing to do stuff for free. So like- Salman Rushdie came and read while this like prog rock band played. Um, we did like all kinds of weird stuff. They still do. Um, and so I stayed there for a really long time. And while I was working there, um, I did the six word memoir books, which was like a web project that then got a book deal. Um, and they put it out two years later because that's how publishing works. And so that was kind of my first real experience in being like, okay, you take something that's popular on the web. Like, how do you turn that into a paper book that people are going to care about? How do you? Like, like put that conversation back into a bookstore and then how do you take that conversation and put it back online and like that constant translating back and forth was very gratifying and it mostly worked because of all this community building and that book was an anthology of 800 people stories right and so you basically had to like mobilize this army of writers around one project um, and so basically like everything I've done since then is that it's like taking book culture and internet culture and smashing it together and getting big communities of people excited about it and doing live parts and internet parts. Um, And now I work at Tumblr, um, and basically I'm like the marketing and community manager, but just kind of for books, writers, publishers, like nonprofits, Poetry Foundation, National Book Foundation, librarians, there's a ton of really amazing librarians on Tumblr. And so just taking all these sort of strains of common interests and helping sort of coalesce it into a big community. Um, So I think like that's the kind of thing Maris is talking about where like, She could have made the blog anywhere, but then like the authors being featured on it were seeing it and being excited. Or like you'd hear like pretty famous writers be like, oh man, I can't wait for the day I'm on Slaughterhouse 9 of 210. And so making those conversations go both directions to me is like the big revelation. Absolutely. Awesome. So that is how these two women got their jobs. But uh, more importantly than how they got their jobs is kind of this idea of why, why now it's possible for those jobs to exist. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of interested in the narrative of especially your, um, your kind of notion of you left this job to go take a job that was supposedly going to be a bigger job, it was going to be more responsibility, and then 2008 happened. And yep. I'm pretty sure many of you were in middle school, but <laughs> it was very scary at the time. Yes. Um, and we had Anna Holmes of Jezebel. Yes. I love um, her. She was She's wonderful. Great. But she came earlier this year, and she, I don't think she actually said this in the program. I think she said this in conversation kind of after the program. But she was talking about how when Jezebel took off, it was kind of – the fact that it took place, it was founded in the mid-2000s, uh, yep. where um, 
so many people, especially young women, bright and interesting and funny young women were either underemployed or just they were employed but they were barely doing anything and they just took to the internet to kind of fill their time. And the result of that were these incredible online communities where things were actually getting done and like, you know, there were incredible things to read, incredible things to see and do, but then also people were able to meet each other. And so do you think that there is kind of this this way of looking at it where it's we're able to be so much more creative because things went so much to hell during that time. <laughs> Maybe that's actually true. It was very freeing. Um, I think that when I started out in book publishing, it was incredibly hierarchical and you knew that you would have to be an assistant and then be an associate and then maybe be an editor and then maybe be a senior editor. And you still might be answering someone else's phone at that for, point. For or a while. Or two other people's phones. Um, and I really do think that the book Dernet allowed us to really speak our minds for the first time. And I think I think I was at Simon and Schuster before social media really took off. And so they were afraid of being sued, I would say. They didn't like people to have their own employees to have their own voices. It was all about promoting the author. And I think there's still some sense of there's, that. There's there's still some sense of that, but it's it's certainly I know a lot of editors and agents now who certainly have their own Twitter yeah. accounts with their own yeah. voices, um, and I hadn't even considered that I had something to say. I was so ready. I loved editing, and I was really excited about the idea of helping someone else say the things they wanted to say, and it really took being fired to um, laid off, sorry. <laughs> um, yes. Um, to think about who I was in, in this community. My first book came out in 2008 and I was working part-time at the bookstore and I don't, I don't think of it as like a, a seminal moment. I mean, for me, it was just like quitting publicity because I wanted to and I had like no children or responsibilities yet and like if I was ever gonna do it, that's when I was gonna do it. And also like, I am I'm seeing so like nostalgic cause I'm old, but like I was paying $700 to live on Spring Street. Like it was just a different time. Like I don't know, I think you do it now. You just live in Bushwick or East Bushwick or East East Bushwick. But, um, but, I, but I do think it was a little different in that freedom. Um, but I think what started to happen, I mean, so the reason I got into all this internet stuff was at Housing Works. So I was running this bookstore, amazing events, amazing people willing to do amazing stuff for us but no marketing budget, like, let's be real, right? Like, I was in charge of marketing PR, the website, running the 200 events a year, like stacking the chairs, taking out the trash, the whole nine. And people kept calling us. We were this little local bookstore on a side street. We were like New York's best kept secret. And they say that like it's a compliment when you're trying to run a business, uh, raise money. So that was my whole thing was like, how do I get people to know about us? And so I started using internet tools because they were there and they were free and I wasn't a very internet-y person. Like I didn't, I just figured this out in that podcast I did. Like people were like, well, how do you manage your like personal internet presence and a professional internet presence? And I was like, that's a really good question. When I ran it for Housing Works, I didn't have one. Right. I had a Housing Works Tumblr, a Housing Works Twitter, a Housing Works Facebook page. I guess I had a personal Facebook page, but it wasn't like a platform. Um, and so, I started doing that to be like, here's this event going on. Like, here's like a cool rare book that we got into the store and people really responded to it. And I was able to really quickly like see who our audience was and people knew what we were about. And I was like very opinionated, but like it's a progressive organization so you kind of can be. And like, um, and, and, and people knew like what kind of books we liked and what our values were and what kind of events we would have. And, and if you have like a sense of what kind of events a place has, you're more likely to just like show up on a Tuesday and see what's there because you like know their general mm -hmm. voice. And so like giving a personality to something I think makes a really big difference. Um, and so I think that as that concept has caught on, people can see the value of having like the senior editor at Knopf have a voice. Um, but I think there's still some push pull. Right. And, and it was easy for me to launch those things because I was at a small nonprofit where no one knew anything and they knew they didn't know anything. And to me, like, that's the real opportunity, right? It was like, if you go into a small organization or like an agency, a lot of time a literary agency is like one 85 year old woman and an assistant. And if she trusts you, that's great, right? Because you can bring all the stuff to the table that they're not doing. Like you can show success so quickly. 
Um, and there are places that will be thrilled when you try new things, and there are places that will be bitchy when you try new <laughs> things. Um, and like, I, that's a great way to figure out where you want to work. But the ability don't. to try is the main thing. I, this is a side note, but I know that there are many companies out there, even if they have a small division that they're working with, and they say, yeah, we're going to act like a startup, and we're going to be scrappy. Um, I think that only works if they actually allow their employees to take risks. Um, and that's a distinction that's worth noting before you accept a job or you know, go from there. Yeah, it's hard though. I mean, if we're gonna do like the real narrative of my career, like when I left Housing Works, uh, partly it was because this a new company, Bookish, that was gonna like save publishing through the <laughs> internet, um, which is what I wanna do basically, um, was like, we love what you're doing. We want you to do this on a national scale with a national budget and like a national audience and like, so I said yes. I mean, that's a simplified version, but basically, and like, that's not what happened. And I worked there for six months, so I went to Tumblr. And like, that can happen too. I think it's really hard to know how things are really gonna be when you get somewhere. That's um, a good point. But it's certainly, and it's frankly, like we were talking about this before, it's harder to say like, I'm 22 straight out of college and I want you to let me take risks than to say like, here's my experience doing this and here's how it's worked in the past and here's, you know. So, or maybe you have done it because this is the whole thing, like you can show what you did for your undergraduate organization, you can show what you did for somewhere you volunteer, like you can show a, a side project that you did for funsies, you can show your Etch-a-Sketch Tumblr. Like <laughs> there is definitely like a lot of ways now to show what you can do. Maybe, right? maybe risk was the wrong word. Um, show creativity perhaps. Yeah, it's initiative. Initiative. To, I mean, yes, cliche, think outside the box. <laughs> You're allowed to do that and, and the internet makes it easier. So I think that we were talking about this earlier. Um, the three of us were getting together and we were talking about the fact that so many of us of here, the kids here at Writer's House, um, are interested in this notion that we had a panel earlier today of should you get an MFA? Like there's always this question of what do I do and how do I do it? I want to be successful, what does that mean? Um, and so we were talking about kind of what to do and what not to do when you're looking at getting a job in these kinds of fields. Um, and one of, them, one of the things that's absolutely essential it seems in this this era of democratized usage of the internet and of personal i hate the term personal branding but personal branding is the fact that when you come to the table for a job interview it doesn't matter if you haven't had a job before in especially in publishing you should have something that you can show that you do online there should be you know and this, there's this notion of i loved um Maris wrote a piece for BuzzFeed that you should definitely read um, about kind of books in New York and the internet and usage, but you were talking about how when you started Slaughterhouse 90210 because your job was unfulfilling, it was wonderful not just because it gave you something to do, but because you couldn't be fired. Like you could take <laughs> It risks. was my own thing. It was your own thing. And Absolutely. so there's, there's this notion also of like, and we were also talking about like, not only should you be pursuing the things that you're creative and interested in on the internet, um, and sharing them with people, but like, um, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> but uh, that it's a way to kind of show that you are able to make yourself do the work, that you have initiative. So mm -hmm. Maris, when she started, I think it's very easy to start a Tumblr. I probably have 12 unused Tumblr uh, and reserved Tumblr I always names. wanna start a Tumblr about Tumblr ideas and just coming up with like <laughs> different Tumblr ideas over and over again. There is one. Uh, okay. <laughs> of course there is. But yeah, I was saying um, when I started my blog, it's not rocket science. <laughs> um, it's I took a bunch of quotes from books I love from authors I admired and paired them with screenshots from TV shows. And it's the kind of thing, yes, anyone could do it. You all you have read books. You can find screenshots from TV shows. Um, I just did it. And I kept doing it day after day, year after year, so that I have a full body of work. And last year, I was able to get a book deal based on that. Um, and I, I think that's so important to just, you are all smart. We know that. That's why you're here. Um, but to be able to express yourself in, in, in a different way and, and really stick to it is, is important. Yeah, another thing beyond just like getting the job, because I feel like in a weird way now we're talking about how you can use all these new tools to get hired in the traditional places. Um, 
And like the industry is diversifying in general, right? So like if you want to do is work with words and storytelling and writing and books or narrative or journalism, like there are just so many more places. Like I feel like maybe this is not true at all, but I feel like you were sort of laughing when you said BuzzFeed, but like how many like maybe you weren't some people do but like how many amazing writers work at oh, buzzfeed now Natasha like BC, i mean like, how how tons. like how many like and not just that but like i don't you don't always talk about anything but like you can you can work at like nook press you can work at like digital first kinds of things you can work on like serialized content um you can like <laughs> you can work at kickstarter you can work at tumblr but also like you know, people talk a lot about all this big like self-publishing revolution and like that is sort of all about people doing it themselves. But then there's these jobs sort of in between. First of all, some of those people are smart enough to know that they need editors and they need designers and marketers. There are agents now who specialize in helping those people shepherd their projects through. There are people who specialize, I don't know if this is not something we talk about. There are people who specialize in helping Kickstarter projects yep. shape their yep. Kickstarter projects. Um, and there are... Um, you know, electric literature is growing all the time. There's a new thing launching called Literary Hub. There's a new thing launching called Catapult, which is like a publisher slash web presence slash live events. Um, so there are more and more all the time things sort of in these communities. And like most of them will fail probably, but like the people building them are learning and they're going to make something new next. And like whether you're going to like make your own thing or you're going to go work at one of these things or you're going to go to the parties that these things throw and meet someone there who's going to hire you to do something totally else. I just think that the opportunities to be in some way involved in writing and or the making public of writing, which is all publishing means, right, um, are like bigger and broader and different all the time. And I, I, I just want to comment before we move on, because you mentioned going to parties um, that these new places are hosting. I would say the biggest piece of advice I can give you is create a community amongst your peers right now. The people sitting next to you are actually the ones who are going to be the people you're going to work with. So it actually doesn't matter what your relationship is to us per se. You guys will be helping each other. Um, and, that's, and I learned that even as um, a book editor when I was acquiring books, I would reach out to literary agents assistants and we would all go out to drinks and talk about how shitty our salaries were and um, complain about our bosses and talk about books we loved and what we wanted to do. And even if we didn't all stick around for that, um, a lot of people are still involved in the community and finding different ways to work and be interesting is much easier if the people you're doing it with are friends, actual friends. Yeah, or just like came up with you. And yes. Because the people who you like want to hire you right now are like going to be retired when you're running shit. <laughs> right? Yeah. We're dead. I like this idea. I'm going to I'm going to push this idea. I want to talk about it a little bit more of the idea of um, creating a network of your peers, because I think that there is this um, a certain. I'm just going to use the word entitlement. I'm just going to use the word entitlement entitlement of certain students who come to places like us, places like Writer's House, where they just come to their career services and they're like, how do I get a job in publishing now? I want a job in publishing now because I like books. Um, we were talking about it earlier about how that's great. Everyone loves books. Um, we hope. We hope. <laughs> but, um, but if you're not tapped in, if you don't know what publishing means, if you don't, if you're great at writing a paper on 17th century poetry, but you haven't read a book that's been released in the past 10 years, you're probably not even going to get an interview. Right. Um, so what do you think are some of the ways that people who are interested in these careers and, and the, this industry that's changing so rapidly and constantly, how, what are the ways that they can tap in and actually have their finger on the pulse? I think knowing what is both on the bestseller list, even if it's not stuff that you're incredibly enthusiastic about, is great. Um, I think knowing about the kind of books that you love that are, are published in the present day is really great, whether that's literary fiction, whether that's a really cool literary magazine that doesn't have that many subscribers, whether it's a zine, whether it's um, a website that publishes digital short fiction, having something in the now 
um, that brings you beyond Moby Dick. We all love Moby Dick. Moby Dick is great. Okay, yeah, you don't. That's right. And you're allowed not to like Moby Dick. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. Um, but, but just showing that you're enthusiastic about a thing that's happening now in publishing is going to help you a lot. And also, just to call you out, um, not only the literary fiction and the lit mag and all those things, or oh, yeah. romance sci-fi, novels, absolutely. or like weird, like, yeah, like obscure genre sci-fi or paranormal romance. I mean, one thing I think a lot of people coming out of schools like this, going into publishing, is like the kind of books that we mostly talk about are like such a small part of the industry. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm very dismissive of diet books and Rush Limbaugh, and I will not apologize for that because I think they're both awful. But like, most publishing jobs, like, there's also, I mean, I think cookbooks are wonderful. I think that, like, children's books are wonderful. I think, like, there's so much else out there. Um, and if you're not going to be happy, in your, if you're not working in one of, like, two or three tiny subgenres, it's going to be hard. Um, and, and frankly, like, and don't go in there anymore. You can't go in there anymore dismissive of, like, fan fiction or, like, Fifty Online Shades of Grey. Or, or like, yeah, I mean, the it's smartest just, people in publishing are talking about Fifty Shades of Grey. And every single employee of Random House got a five thousand dollars bonus that year. Nice. Just, just putting that out there. Um, That's not a secret, is it? I don't, know. Is it I don't, don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> oh. I think there is a Times article about it. Okay. Right? We Probably. Hope. Okay. We hope who's, so. Who's watching anyway? We don't know, right? Yeah. Just Jamie Attenberg. Hi, Jamie. Um, um. <laughs> I'm only friends with Jamie because she's active on the internet. It's true. It's true. Uh, um, I'm totally lost now. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Things to do to be up on the industry. If we want to go like really nitty gritty, there's a lot of free newsletters you can subscribe to, um, like Shelf Awareness and uh, Publishers Weekly Daily and all that kind of stuff. And then there's like everybody's got a tiny letter now. I don't know if you guys are are down with tiny letter, (laughs) but like personal newsletters to people in the industry. Obviously, follow people on Twitter and Tumblr. Um, You know, and like I'm not saying like drive yourselves crazy like learning an industry while you're still like living a college life, but. I mean, how do you even know if you want to work in publishing if you don't really know what publishing does, I guess? All right. Well, I mean, (laughs) we're going to get back to uh, publishing careers and questions about how to do it later. But um, I kind of want to, while you're here, talk about community on the internet and how how we are actually engaging and how these sites that we all know and love are actually making things happen for people. Um, And so I'd love to talk, A, about... I brought a couple books that I have... (laughs) Specifically because oh, I backed them on covers so on uh, whatever. <laughs> specifically because I backed them on Kickstarter. One of which is Rachel Zine, which is delicious. It's a <laughs> it's called Hi, Stock Tips and it's about soup. Um, um, can I, I should something about that quickly. Yes, actually? go for it. I mean that's kind of a perfect example. So I'm just a person with a tumbler. I cook a lot of soup. I started taking pictures of soup and putting it on my blog. That's it. And then someone was like, how'd you make that chicken soup? And I told them, and then I said, uh, I think that's everything, but let me know if you need any more stock tips, like chicken stock, like I just said it. And then I was like, oh, that's a pun, stock tips. And so I started tagging all my soup posts with stock tips, and then all these other people started tagging all their soup posts with stock tips too, just on Tumblr. And so if you search stock tips on Tumblr now, you'll get like more pictures of tomato rice soup than like financial spam. Um, We've won. Yes. <laughs> uh, and... Um, Oh, and then one thing that happened was like John Green reblogged it, and so then there were like teenagers like trying to like do it. It was how do I make a soup? Like tweeting at you? Like, yeah, 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 <laughs> for real. And so this was just something that happened organically. It took off. It was like, and we were all showing each other recipes and talking about soup. That was literally it. And then um, people were like, "You could get a book deal," and I didn't have the energy. I don't really know how to cook that well. So me and Amy Grieco, who is a friend of ours, who works at Goodreads and is also into cooking and Tumblr. Um, she was really making a lot of zines because she was traveling and she was sending them people back here. And like, you know, we were 14 in 1994, so zines are very important to us. Um, and so we were like, okay, we're just gonna make a zine, right? And then we put it up on Kickstarter just to get money for like the printing and the shipping. And then people wanted in. And so we had a $500 goal and we ended up raising like $7,000. And it turned out that like, we were like, we're weirdos. We like zines and soup. And then all these other people were like, we so also we. like zines and soup. <laughs> yeah. And even like, and the cross stitch thing. And we like wrote about like listening to NPR while we were like making our zines. Like we're such nerdy 30 year old ladies. And everyone was like, yes. yes. <laughs> like, and so I think that, and also it's an anthology basically, right? So like Jamie Attenberg sent us a soup story and Kate Christensen sent us a soup story and 
Emily Gould sent us a soup story. Um, so it, it's kind of like feminist writers on soup, but I didn't it's really true. mean to. Um, it wound up. But so it's this community project. It was community funded. Um, we had like friends over to stuff the envelopes and mail them out to people. Mm -hmm. And then people got them and took pictures of them and posted pictures of like, so like um, Kevin Nguyen, who uh, works at Oyster Books now, used to work at Amazon, is just like a internet -y, book -y guy. And he got his mother to send her full recipe. And it's literally in here now, I can't find it, of course, like as a printout of the email that she sent him. And this is an actual picture of when he cooked it for us. Um, and there's people all over the country who he's never met making his mother's family recipe and like sending them pictures of it. And he's showing his mom and she's like, who is that? Where did you get this? Like, what's going on? <laughs> and like, this to me is just such a perfect example of like, I mean, you guys grew up in this, so I think it's like not that shocking, but like, so what I almost want to tell you is the other half, right, is like, for most of our lives, there was no way to end up making somebody's secret family recipe if you did not know them. Like, there's just these very personal things happening. And so, like, I don't want to get too held up on, like, here's an interview for a job, when my point is sort of, like, all the writers you admire or, like, basketball players you admire or, like, Planned Parenthood executives you admire or, like, <laughs> whatever are, are on the internet talking to each other and you about and like, things that make them human. So yes. yeah. So I think we were talking about this earlier. Obviously, I am a fan of soup and the scene and Kickstarter, but I think it's it's very important to note not just that this is a thing that you can do on the internet, but it is a way to make yourself a human, a marketable human. Like it's it's great if you can show that you've created a website or run a reading series or whatever, but sure. also take it back to job hunting. Yeah, right? no, but, <laughs> but also like it's you know, when, when people are interviewing you, they're also interviewing you for who is going to spend time in my office. So if you're a drone, that's going to be great for the editorial assistant job, but maybe not a job with tenure track. Like, I, I would even say if you're a drone, um, you can make you're not, publishing. absolutely. Um, I just want to take it a little further to Kickstarter because I think Kickstarter is a place where people realize that um, the story that you tell is just as exciting as the thing that you're actually making. And so much of what we um, encourage at Kickstarter is to really tell your story, tell why you want to make this thing that you're making. This is Liz Colville's um, novel, novella, cover story. Um, talk about how you got there, talk about how you did it, talk about your friend who gave you edits and the way you found the guy who designed your cover. These are all things that fans want to know. They want to interact. And Kickstarter, you know, started out five years ago um, while the Tumblr revolution was already happening. But I think one of the things that brings it all together is that there's a community of people who want to talk about your work with you, around you, with other fans, um, and that's such an important part of a lot of publishing now. Well, that's really central to the whole Kickstarter thing, too, I think, is like, it's not just a pre-order. If you just want to pre-order a book, you can do it on Etsy, you can do, I mean, you can do it anywhere. And so it's more about wanting to actually, like, be a part of something, right? So, like, Absolutely. it is a community every, I mean, it depends, right? I've bought, like, fancy soaps on Kickstarter where, like, I really just wanted the soap, <laughs> and it doesn't matter. And But then I bought things on Kickstarter where I want to, like, be part of the process of something. Absolutely, right. and then there's there's another track where self-publishing a book isn't the only thing that you can do on, on Kickstarter in the book publishing category. One of our very good friends um, just ran a, speaking of Moby Dick, a Moby Dick reading marathon that was three days. She got about 100 authors and writers and other book people um, to come and read tiny sections of the book. She used Kickstarter to raise money for flyers and for refreshments and for renting out spaces. And it was just so fun. And that was a great use of, of the platform and just a really great time. And in terms of the community connections too, right? And then there's like a chowder chapter and then she got a local restaurant to give us chowder for the event and then she got their secret chowder recipe and then she asked me to make a zine of it and then that was one of the rewards and then someone made a, a whale hat and there was like a photo shoot like there was just like all these different pieces of the community brought together and I think that's a big thing I guess on the book or not in general yep um, right like Maris's whole thing is like tv and lit and then there's like a great tumblr that's like cocktails and lit um or like there's a, a friend of ours who who illustrates like book readings and so it's like 
it's so much about all your different interests. I mean, I guess, and this is a, and your a take weird on things too. Is yeah. like about all the different things that people like and how you can pull them all together. And like, I do that in person too. Right, going back to the Housing Works events, those events were really often like here's a band and here's an author and here's a poet and here's like an animated movie that we're going to play over the top like while that's going on and here's a woman who's trying to start a bakery with cocktails and she's made like bourbon mm-hmm. peanut cupcakes that she's going to give out for free and like it, it's just like that place is called Spirited it's in Brooklyn you should all go <laughs> um, but like the the bringing together of all the different cool things your friends can do is like so old fashioned in a way right like it's so like like church social or I've never been to a church social but you know what I mean like the, <laughs> the like there's something very like old school community about like you can bake pies and you can watch the kids and you can play the guitar and like it feels that way on the internet now yeah. I think yeah. so what are the tips that you give like when you're when you're talking to somebody who's I don't know Roger Movidivre who wants to like print this book and they're yes. like we did this amazing bookmobile thing we want to print a book what is what is the advice that you give when you're like this is how to actually engage a community around not just wanting to give you money for a book but like wanting to be a part of the creation of this book absolutely so there are a couple of key things um kickstarter projects um have a a bunch of different ways that you can communicate with the people who will interact with your project um so the first one is there's a video and a project page um and that's where you're you you tell everybody what you're working on, what you're passionate about, why you're doing it. Um, the video can be something as simple as, Rachel and Amy, did you set up an, an iPhone? Yeah, that's why it was so like below our necks and looked so horrible. But they, <laughs> they did really well. <laughs> Just giving a, real, a feel for who you are. Um, and then there are project updates that you can send out while you're in the process of doing things. Um, which is a really great way to kind of look inside the process. Um, so and I, even in, sorry, yeah, no, even in ahead. terms of those, like, like be yourself, you're not only a whatever thing, like our updates weren't like, here's the soup we're cooking. Our updates were like, there were like pictures of us, like watching Beyonce videos while we were like supposed to be making zines. And like, there, it was just like, it's much more. I guess like the same as on like Tumblr or Twitter or whatever, but it was sort of like, we're people, here's what we're doing, you're people. I don't, maybe this is like not as like, they know how to be people on the internet, but like, like people who were professionals before the internet, I think are like so need to be told that. And they even don't believe that, yeah. it when they're told that. I Very mean, I old think There's a real sense that your update should be like, we have written 36 pages of this 200 page <laughs> We will novel. get, thank you for we your are, patience. Pre- yes, <laughs> absolutely. And, um, Yes, the best the best updates are just all about personality, um, and the, and then the third um, key thing is the reward. So I I actually this was before my time, yeah. but um, one of the things I tell people is make the thing, make the thing that you want to make. Don't make a tote bag if you're going to spend all the time stressing about your tote bag and you want to write a book. It's not worth it. Um, offer experiential rewards though. Offer um, offer a Skype phone call or something um, about either even if, if you want to talk about the thing that you're making or you have a special topic you want to discuss. Things that are interactive, things that make a community out of the people who have backed your project and, and you. Because a book you can go buy somewhere and a tote bag you can go buy somewhere, right? But the things that are like super specific to this weird thing you're all into. Yeah. Um, can only be gotten that way. Cool. All right, and then I guess we're running up on only 10 minutes left. I do want to cover the Reblog Book Club quickly, and then we'll open up to questions. And so the Reblog Book Club, how many people know about? Uh, <laughs> Girl. Yes. All right. Um, so, Reblog Book Club is Tumblr's official book club, which basically means that I run it. Which, by the way, has only been running for a little bit over a year. That's crazy. It's an institution, uh, institution. already. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I wanted to do a book club from the minute I started. Like, I want to be the Oprah of the internet. I want to be like, here's an obscure feminist debut novelist you've never heard of. Now she's a number one New York Times bestseller. Like, I will make no shame of, like, that's what I want to do. I am not there yet. Um, and Getting it was hard there. to start. I'm trying, man. Start competing with you, too. How do you feel about that? Oh. We'll talk. What? 
Uh, Mark Zuckerberg started a Facebook book club, oh, yeah. which is in no way as good as the Reblog book club. Like, not in any no. single way at all. No, sales. Better in sales. Um, <laughs> I don't feel like he probably watches live stream from the Kelly's Writer's House. I Hi, think Mark. I'm going to be okay. Um, but it was super hard. I mean, these are the kinds of things, like, I went in and I want to do it immediately, right? But I'm like, I'm part of a big company. I'm speaking for them. Um, like, we have 13-year-olds and we have grown-ups. There's a lot, people love YA books on there, but not only YA. And like, how do you pick a book to have a conversation with this incredibly broad community? Um, and so we ended up starting with Fangirl, which is a Rainbow Rowell novel, and it's YA, but it's all like it. And it's super, super fan culture-y. It's like about a fan fiction writer and like the characters in it, like use the internet to find community and they love books and they, are transformative. I mean, I think that another thing that like doesn't maybe seem new to you guys that is so new is this idea that like it's okay for the readers of books to take them and make them their own and make the characters do different things and like make like you know cartoons of them or like change the genders of the characters or like write a lot of nasty porn about them and it's wonderful. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Um, and so, uh, so the Reblog Book Club is basically where we take a book. Oh, and then also it's so tricky, right? So like there's spoilers, right? Do you only talk about it when you're done? Like at what pace do people read? So we broke it down. Yeah, to be clear, I'm going to interrupt. Um, it's So the book club, for those of you who have not participated, it is not that Tumblr chooses a book and then they set up a Skype or something. It's not that there is a set time and we're all going to get together for brunch on Sunday to discuss the book. <laughs> it is on Tumblr. So you're reading it and to participate in the book club, you're just talking about it on your Tumblr. And so that is like kind of the challenge. Yeah. And then there's a main Tumblr for it. So like you would go on your Tumblr and you'd write a response to something that happened and you'd tag it reblog book club. And then I would find it and reblog it into the main conversation. And then someone else would reblog it out and be like, oh really? I loved when he did that. Like I thought it was really sincere. I don't think he was being whatever. And then someone else would reblog it and be like, Ugh, I hate that character. He's worse than the guy in that book. And so it's actual conversations. And I think that's really hard on a lot of other platforms. And the author is participating um, and reblogging onto their own blog and stuff, um, not just for like a one hour Twitter view or whatever, but kind of all the way through. Um, and people are making fan art and nail art and videos and playlists. And they're like cooking things that were in the book. Um, there's a woman who. Um, makes quilts like oh. even if she doesn't like the book that's my favorite there was a one she wrote where she was like i didn't really end up liking this book here's the quilt i made in response to it <laughs> she's you know, a genius dedication. i love her what's I, the name of her do you know her lady kate's i have like three pieces of her hi i have like three pieces of her craft art um and uh, a spoon rest that she made me in Ooh. my living room um but like that's what I mean is like she's someone I didn't know. She got involved in this book club. She did really beautiful art. I bought some. Like now I talk about her here. Maybe someone will go find her Etsy shop and buy something. Like this, it never ends. <laughs> really, <laughs> I'm exhausted. Um, <laughs> but so the idea of the Reblog Book Club is we're reading one book together. There's real conversations. It's an actual club. I mean, when I'm snotty about other online book clubs, I think that's basically what I mean is like not only is it an opportunity to hear from the writer or talk to the writer, it's an opportunity to talk to other people about the book and make friends and have sincere conversations with someone who might be 30 years older than you and live on the other side of the world. And like, it doesn't matter. Um, and so that's like, that's my real goal, um, aside from becoming the Oprah of the internet. Yeah, I like those two. I think one of the, one of the interesting things about the Reblog Book Club also is that you're not seeking out, when you choose a book, and we've, you've done five of them so far, right? When you choose a book, you're not looking at who is the most famous person that's going to have the broadest reach on Tumblr. You're looking at, well, I think at first it was Rainbow Rowell because she was already on Tumblr. Um, she was a good literary citizen. Yes, she was, she was a, a good great literary, literary citizen. citizen. Um, um, yeah, it was for a lot of reasons. I mean, that's a great book, Fangirl. Um, and, and people had read Eleanor in Park, so they were excited for Fangirl. And Rainbow's been on Tumblr forever. And like, she's not on Tumblr as like, I'm an author and here's my social presence. She's on Tumblr as like, a nerdy weirdo fangirl who's been on Tumblr for years. Um, and she's kind of a neat example too. Like she, uh, I don't know if you guys know LeakyCon. <laughs> it's a Harry Potter convention and other fandom convention. Like Rainbow went as a person who bought a ticket and attended <laughs> one year and went as like a super high level featured superstar the next year. Um, and so I think that the sort of like, I am a fan. I am a professional. Like, none of that mm. is there anymore. There's just, like, so much level playing field. And I think especially on Tumblr, right? We don't have, like, fan pages. We don't have algorithms. Like, 
uh, an individual blog and a super famous person's blog and like the Coca-Cola advertising blog are like all the same thing. So I think, yeah, I think that uh, I brought this up kind of, I, I know that like talking about how to run a successful Kickstarter and talking about Reblog Book Club kind of seem like completely different things. But the purpose, I think, of bringing these concepts together is that to make things happen on the internet, A, you have to remember that you're making things happen on the internet because you're using the internet to be human and connect with other humans. Absolutely. And also to make anything successful, more than two people have to be interested. So it has to be all about creating this community, connecting with other people around actual shared interests instead of just how can we make the most books happen rather than how can we care about the books we're and making? And finding the people. I mean, I think that people are so convinced that the internet is giant and broad and you have to be John Green. And like, you can publish a book that only 7,000 people want to read if you can find every single person Absolutely. who wants to read it to That's buy that book. Seller. 7,000 is a lot. <laughs> and so like when I was here with like, like no social media and not that much internet and no cell phones, like there were probably other people here who might want to make a zine about soup, but I'm not sure I would have known how to find them without like wearing a sandwich board on Locust Walk. So like <laughs> the ability to sort of find the people wherever they might live who are into the same weird thing as you and bring them together is so cool. And reach out. Like you don't have to wait. I mean, that's part of it is just putting it out there and hoping somebody will find it, but reach out to people. Like it's not scary. It's not hard. You can just... That's how I became friends with Maris. Yeah. I tackled her at a bookstore and told her that I'm obsessed with her blog. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And, and, and then we were just talking about two of the people who emailed me in 2008 when I first put out, um, when I started doing the blog, um, said, oh, we should just like meet for a drink. Um, one of them writes for the New Yorker regularly now, and one of them is an entertainment reporter at New York Magazine. Um, and we were just pals. Um, and I think that speaks, again, to creating the community of people around you. Um, and telling people when you think they're awesome. And telling people when that's a big part of fandom. And it's also about just creating a, a community and being a good literary citizen. Right. I'm going to open it up to questions because we're almost at 6 PM. Do we have the mic? Yeah, yeah. All right. You were trying to get me to say that in unison, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do it at the end. OK. Hi there. I really enjoyed your talk, both as a uh, professional librarian and a writer and someone with a blog. What's your name? Hi, I'm Saray Johnson. It's so nice to meet you. It's great to meet you all. Um, I had a, a question mostly from the blogging side, particularly from the Tumblr side. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice for establishing yourself and mining what is obviously personal branding, cult of personality, call it what you'd like, um, inside of a very small niche. Um, and if uh, I know you were talking about not having an algorithm, but uh, what sort of community, what does community building look like when you're not talking about something classic like Moby Dick, but like rather about having a disability or being black and trans or, or something that mm -hmm. uh, while there's still lots of readership, it's not a traditional audience that you can tap. There's a lot of it on Tumblr though. Um, <laughs> no, totally. I mean, I think that in a way that's like the best part is like, you can find people to talk to you about Moby Dick, like just go to university or whatever, but like, I think there's there's a lot of very niche stuff that um, some of it is tags, um, like literally like putting tags on your post and searching tags in Tumblr and knowing what the tags are. So like, I don't know if you know the Tumblrian tag. And um, basically, <laughs> I'm not really supposed to say this on record, but I love it so much. Um, What's that? Basically, the Tumblrian tag exists because if you search the librarian tag, which would seem like the normal thing to do, you oh, just find sexy. a lot of sexy, oh, sexy. librarians. Oh. Oh. Wearing low-cut dresses, Boo. leaning against shelves, um, which I'm into personally. But uh, so Tumblrian was the tag that they made to actually talk about librarianship on Tumblr. And so if you go to Librarian, you get that stuff. And if you go to, I mean, and the general stuff too. But if you go to Tumblrian, it's like, I have to do reader's advisory with like 13-year-old boys. And last time I gave them this book, they really hate it. And like, what do, and then someone will reblog it and give advice. And so we're at Winter Institute right now. And are you going to be at blah, blah, blah for drinks at 6 o'clock? Because that's yeah, where oh, I'll yeah, be. Yeah, there's a lot of that too. So and so sometimes it's knowing the right tags. Um, and related tags can help with that, too. Um, and then there'll be usually like one or two like big influencers, even in the little niches, I think. Um, and following those people and seeing who they reblog and following those people. Um, and also, some people have started to make kind of user directories. So like um, there's one of librarians on Tumblr. There's one of YA writers on Tumblr. Um, I suspect there's like trans activists of color. I just would have to find it. Um, sometimes, I'm also not supposed to say this, sometimes Googling just on Google works better than searching inside Tumblr. 
and sometimes searching inside Tumblr works better. It kind of just depends. Mm-hmm. Um, I go cross-platform a lot, right? Like I'll, I'll go on Twitter and say like, anyone have a good Tumblr about teen dystopian series or whatever? Um, I think that sometimes it's just like something that you write and like I would tag really carefully, but sometimes something you write will get reblogged by someone who is searching for that same tag. Yeah, and then it starts moving in that community. And then I even just suggested to someone, and this was about a book, but it was like they were trying to find people who were into this book that like just came out and is um, kind of like getting popular. And I was like, put up a cool picture and just write like, reblog if you're already down with this book. And like, then you can look at the thread, right? And sometimes they're crazy. Like you'll see ones that literally say like, reblog if you're a book blog. And then they have like 433,000 notes. Um, but if it's something really specific, um, that can be a good way sometimes just to find people, spending the time digging in. Um, and then sometimes there's external things like, um, you know, like they'll, they'll be like BuzzFeed lists of like 12 great activists on Tumblr, or they'll be like, Um, articles on specialist places like The Millions, which is a really popular book blog, often does features about what's going on in the literary community on Tumblr. Um, So I think it's just keeping your eyes open in a bunch of different places. Um, And if there's a few people in your community who you know are sort of influential, and sometimes it's just a matter of asking them, like, hey, could you reblog us? I'm really trying to find people who would want to come to this event or whatever. Um, I think that, I mean, some people just email me to reblog stuff. you know, depending on what it is. Um, but I think that, like, yeah, don't be afraid to ask for stuff like that because people want to build a community too, right? I mean, especially you're not saying, like, reblog me, like, asking for money, I presume. <laughs> so, like, I mean, unless. Uh, no. Kickstarter is not about asking for money. Sorry. It's about building a community. Yes. Okay. Wrong. I'm wrong. <laughs> I asked people to reblog this because I was asking for money. Um, <laughs> but uh, But in general, right, if you were saying, like, would you guys be interested in this event or would you guys be interested in reading a zine about whatever or it's that can be a good way to do it cool that was a really long answer i'm sorry hi hi i'm stephanie hey um i was just wondering because i'm also like kind of interested in this whole idea of the book genetic communities especially i've also been really into like book blogs for a while because that was like a way that i discovered books to read and i was wondering like you know it's so great that the internet allows kind of a more personalized touch to publishing, but I was kind of wondering what do you think about some of the more negative aspects, for example, like authors reacting badly to people who are reviewing their books in not a great way. It's, and it's like getting disseminated on the internet because there's like, I mean, there's, I know there's a lot of controversy last year, like one author in particular. Um, and I was just wondering what your thoughts on that are. I, so, so I have a book coming out in October and I have a Goodreads page set up and um, I'm already starting to monitor it a little bit. Maris, Christ. I know, and that is the worst thing in the world you can do, I think, Um, because when you put things out in the world, you're gonna have to take the good and the bad, like the facts of life, I guess. Um, And for me, I don't know if this is for everyone, I want to be able to enjoy the good so much that the negative stuff doesn't get to me. It's almost humanly impossible to do that, I think. And um, I think it's just a matter of staying positive and finding the good stuff because there is good stuff. Little known fact, if you are the author on a Goodreads page, and you click to reply to a review, you will get a pop-up that says, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> we really think you shouldn't do that. We really recommend that you do not do that. Yeah. No, that's real. Um, and so I think that it's a very tricky question, right? Because it used to be like, oh, you don't respond to reviews, you don't read your reviews, blah, blah, blah. And like, for a lot of writers, I think it's very valuable to have conversation with their fans. 100%. I, mean, I think it's an amazing opportunity. Um, so I, I, it's difficult. I mean, I think that did you when did you listen to the Lindy West podcast about that was amazing? Yeah, um, confronting her trolls. Yes, uh, it's on This American Life, and she has like an actual phone conversation, and he flat out says like You seemed really comfortable with yourself, and, and I, I wasn't, it. and that made me mad. And that was like the most gratifying thing I've ever heard because we just want to imagine that there's. Yeah. Um, oh. But uh, okay. <laughs> but I think that it. 
from the fan side too, right? Like not just about how to take it as a writer, but from the fan side, like, do you want to interact with your heroes? Do you want to have these conversations? You don't have to care what a writer thinks, actually. Like you can think something different about their book than they do. Um, I think you need a code for yourself. Like I, I, a good one I think probably is like criticize the work, but don't criticize the person. Um, I think that that's pretty tricky with like memoir and essay and like Absolutely. how can you criticize the work of Kathleen Hale's essay about stalking that woman which is what you're talking about um, <laughs> without criticizing her behavior um, but I also I mean whatever we all know this right like women get reviewed for themselves not for like the books that they Absolutely. write and, like, I, and, and especially like personal writing and essays and like it's a whole thing um, and so I think that just for yourself decide how much you want to say or not say I mostly never say anything negative about a book online um Unless it's, like, I think harmful to the world, in which case I don't really care. Um, and Or if it's, like, just so, so famous that, like, no one's going to care. Or I will dead. talk shit about Carl of Knossgaard. Like. Oh, yeah, that one's pretty fun, <laughs> I got to say. Um, <laughs> but I think that it's super complicated. Like, I don't have a good answer for you, and I spend a lot of time working with authors, Um and I think for some people it is like, how dare they? What right do they have? And for some people it's like the coolest opportunity they've ever had. Um, and it applies across the board, right? Like there might be book bloggers you don't like, or there might be like booktubers who you think are dumb, but like you're probably not gonna say so. Remember that everybody's human. And, and, and I think that's a good thing to remember too, that authors are reading their Goodreads pages and they're they're seeing what you write and they're human and um but that doesn't mean you can never say like yeah, it doesn't mean don't was predictable or absolutely that's the tricky part I think absolutely but but yeah okay but yeah let's about this let's, yeah we'll, maybe we'll just take one more question <laughs> sorry yay okay hi Rachel I'm the one that interviewed you two years ago when I first started working at Pen Press about hi. Tumblr poetry and what's your things? Tumblr URL or is that a secret it's not a secret. Um, it's actually jmariestrad.com, and it's linked to theweekendneverends.tumblr.com. Got it. Um, and so I've been trying to convince my boss to get a Tumblr for our publishing house for two and a half years, and I clandestinely created one um, under like a pseudonym <gasps> just to like create an example. Take Love it. Risks. Love and it. That's it got, the risk. It quickly got indexed into Google, and our marketing director found it, and I got a slap on the wrist for doing it. Um, so I'm wondering, I mean, hearing all of your experiences working in publishing is like resonating so strongly with me <laughs> because everyone who works in my publishing office is really, really knowledgeable about traditional publishing and they're really like, brilliant people and I learn so much from them every day, but they know nothing about the internet, mostly. University presses are... Yeah, I know. We're, we are like the, the, the darkest corner of publishing <laughs> in terms of coming into they're the 21st tricky. century. And I'm I just mean, wondering, I think like... Sorry. It's okay. I'm just wondering, <laughs> like, how can... Because the thing is, I... I I love academia, so like I don't want to leave my job and go somewhere that's more trendy because I love being the person that I am in that like dark corner. But like, how do you how do you bridge that like talk with like when your boss is sixty two and you're twenty four and you're like we need this thing, or do you just keep like do you just hold out until like they retire, or like you know how do you like how do you talk you talk to people who I'm sure are much much older than you every day like how do you have that conversation in an understandable way without like looking ridiculous, I guess, to them. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I would say is that, I mean, one reason university presses are especially hard is it's easier to convince someone that, like, someone might buy a $5 zine because of a Tumblr post than, like, $120, like, but, um, <laughs> but I think that, so part of it is, like, we've already built it, right? So, like, you don't need to show him a Tumblr for his own company if you're going to get in trouble for that. But you can show him Oxford University Press. Oh, you I can did. show him Georgetown University Press. <laughs> you can show him, I, I mean, and then right. and the American Museum of Natural History and the White House. Like, there are auspicious organizations of all kinds on Tumblr. Yeah. And it wasn't always true. And so it's easier for me now because usually anyone who's reluctant, I can show them the best in class of their category doing it. Um, Oxford University Press is the oldest brand on all of Tumblr. They're like 500 years old or something. They have an amazing Tumblr, and part of it, and this is a good thing for university presses too, is that um, your mission probably technically, or at least this is what, how they did it, right, is like it's not even to sell books or make money. It's to like educate and to like broaden human knowledge. So like taking time out of somebody's day to put like an Arabic phrase and its like etymology and like why it's relevant today up on this blog was like 
making the world a little more educated. And so I call this the Sesame Street thing because when I met with Sesame Street, um, the first, I was really early in my job and I met with Sesame Street and I was like, it's so great that you're on Tumblr even though you really do television. And they were like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like our mission is to educate children and families everywhere they are and that's why we're on television and that's why we're on the iPad and that's why we're on Tumblr and that's why we're everywhere. And I was like, <laughs> And so when I work with NPR, or I work with a museum or I work with, and even for-profit publishers, I mean, I think that that idea of like taking the stuff that you know and putting it out into the world, that's what mm -hmm. library Tumblr's all about. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of really amazing library is <laughs> and like the University of Iowa Special Collections Library kind of started this trend where the most like the libraries where no one's allowed to touch anything, the like illuminated manuscripts from the Middle Ages have started tumblers. So that the stuff that usually maybe like PhD students are allowed to see, anybody with an internet connection can see. So like, I mean, I'll get really, really like making the world a better place about this. So to me, the argument is like. You guys exist to like bring knowledge into the world. Like, you guys exist to publish books, to make information public. Like, to not be willing to share that seems selfish. Crummy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that said, like, also, like, yeah, if your boss says no, you can't do it, and maybe your energy would be better spent making a Tumblr of something that interests you, and just like building that community yourself. And then maybe when you like get asked to be on NPR talking about the Tumblr you made, uh -huh. your, your boss might be like, well, oh, shit. Right. <laughs> um, like, like, frankly, you're more likely to take the world by storm with some crazy Tumblr idea of your own than with the University of Pennsylvania Press, probably. Um, I don't know, but that's exactly the thing, right? So that's why I'm like not necessarily telling you to like ask forgiveness on permission. <laughs> um, but I guess I don't, armed with the like, best in class social media presences of some of the most auspicious organizations in the world, I can't really understand how someone could not be mildly interested. I would also say though that um, if your boss is stuck in his ways, like fine, keep your job, love what you're doing, and then yeah, start your own, do your own Tumblr stuff, put all of your creative energy into that so that, you can feel fulfilled in that way too. And so that once he gets on board, you have yeah. honed your chops mm -hmm. in the Tumblr world. But I do think that, I mean, I, I, I am not kind of a outreach person in an organization like Rachel and Morris are, but I can say that you have the advantage of working at a place with a mission. And so you can always frame your argument in terms of this is a way that we can reach out and actually fulfill our mission mm -hmm. in a new way that people are actually using. Um, because it is difficult to get people to buy textbooks. It's not difficult to get them to hit follow. Um, so just brush up. I just think framing is such a big part of the mm -hmm. argument. I did the exact same thing actually, squatted on Kelly Writer's House's Tumblr for like four years before Al was like, yeah, do, do a Tumblr. Why don't we do a Tumblr? <laughs> so so that's that happens. So keep doing that. Okay. <laughs> But I think that we we're a little bit late, so I'm gonna end it up here. Thank you so much to Rachel and Maris for Thank having us. Thank you so us. much for having us. And keep tumbling. There is food out there. Please come eat. Uh, I think these ladies will be here for a while if you have other yeah. questions. So, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.